All right, well, thank you for returning after hearing the first lecture on Friday. Um, much appreciated. So what I'm going to do today is um, take off where we left off last time. So for the first five minutes of this um, talk today, I'm going to go through the timeline that we established on Friday, uh, both for a review, because it's hard to remember things up on the long weekend, and also we'll set the stage for what I want to talk about next. So um, for the first five minutes, let's review our story. So we divided the history of the universe into five ages, and we define time, or we measure time, by what's called the cosmological decade, where if I write the time as 10 to the n years, then n is a cosmological decade. The one number you need to remember is that the universe is now 13.8 giga years old, and that means we're now a cosmological decade of 10. So we're right in the middle of the second era, the Stoliferous era. So for the first million years, there are no stars. Then stars form and we're in a very bright era called the Stoliferous Era. The stars burn out and we enter into the Degenerate Era. That's when degenerate stellar remnants are the most important stellar bodies in the universe. That continues until protons decay. We don't really know this number here, but protons we do think some time will decay. And I'll say more about that today. And then the black holes become the brightest things in the sky. They evaporate and we're left in the fifth and final era. So for a few minutes, I'm going to go through each of these five eras and give you the um, just a newsreel of the events that we talked about last time. So we're going to do for basically five minutes what we did for two and a half hours on Friday. And that will get those of you who weren't here on Friday a chance to catch up. So in the first era, we started with what I call the Big Bang moment. And all I mean by this is that we can't really slice time any um, finer than the Planck time. So it doesn't make sense to go back in time two times less than about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Then we talked about the inflationary universe. That happens on times from 10 to the minus 37 to maybe 10 to the minus 35 seconds. During the next microsecond, the universe sets up an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. As we saw, that plays an important role because if there's a channel that lets you violate baryon number, then protons will eventually decay because they have a lower energy state available to them. Also, at about the microsecond mark, quarks get confined into the headlines, protons and neutrons. And at the one second mark, two things happen. The dark matter abundances become frozen, and the nucleosynthesis of light elements begins. So for three minutes, from one second to about three minutes, we forge about a quarter of all of the universe, all of the universe's protons, into helium. And as we said, that represents more nucleosynthetic work that has ever been done since that time in all the stars and all the galaxies over the whole universe. And then this um, process, or this era, continues until the universe is old enough to produce stars. And then it produces stars. We're right in the middle of this bright stelliferous era right now. Stars are dominating energy production. Some of the things that we talked about was the fact that low mass stars become increasingly important as the universe ages into the future. We talked about how our biosphere will end about three and a half billion years from now, maybe even sooner, but um, that's kind of the longest we have. The Earth as a planet will probably be swallowed by the sun in about seven billion years. Now, the odds of Earth escaping during the three and a half billion year window or being captured are about 1.10 to the 5 and 1.3 million. million. And what's remarkable about that number isn't that <clears throat> these are particularly high odds, they're actually quite low odds. What's remarkable about this number is that we can actually calculate this with some confidence. Um, we also made the argument that most liquid water environments are going to be found inside frozen planets. And finally, we showed that both star formation and stellar evolution come to an end at about the same time. They both have characteristic lifetimes measured in tens of trillions of years. So that when the universe is younger than 10 trillion years, stars are shining brightly, the universe is an energetic place. And after the, after the universe ages beyond tens of trillions of years, say cosmological decade 14, all the stars burn out and we can make no more stars. The universe changes its character rather abruptly and we enter into the next era, which we call the degenerate era. During this time, there are four types of bodies that are left. There are brown dwarfs, which are born degenerate, so they're hoarding all of the unburned hydrogen. There are white dwarfs. Remember, most stars, 997 out of 1,000 of them, will become white dwarfs upon their death. The three out of a thousand that blow up when they die will become either neutron stars or black holes. We've seen that star <coughs> formation continues at a very low rate through brown dwarf collisions. White dwarfs will have their own energy source by capturing dark matter particles and re-radiating them. 
The galaxy will evaporate over about 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21 years, and all the while black holes continue to grow. Now this era ends once the protons decay, and I've remarked that we don't really know what the proton lifetime is, although we have a firm <coughs> experimental lower limit that the proton lives longer than about 10 to 33 years. So after the protons decay, so on time scales of 10 to the 50 even longer, black holes are the brightest things in the sky, and they radiate through Hawking radiation. So about the only thing to say during this era is that the um, lifetime of a black hole goes like the cube of the mass. We have for each large galaxy like the Milky Way, basically one great big supermassive black hole and of order a million stellar black holes. The stellar black holes typically have masses of tens of stellar or solar masses, so they will live for 10 to the 68, 10 to the 69 years. The supermassive black holes have masses in the range of millions to billions of solar masses, so they will live from about 83 cosmological decades up to 10 to the 90 or so. But even a black hole with the mass of the entire observable universe today will evaporate in only 10 to the 130 years or so. So compared to infinity, that's a really short amount of time. And that tells you that black holes aren't forever, and will eventually enter into the fifth and final era, which we call the dark era, and it will be very, very dark, right? So what you have here are all the leftover dregs from the physical processes that we went through before, leftover electrons, positrons, and neutrinos. And at the end, we talked about the possibility of a vacuum tunnel event. So this is the story of our universe, which you can summarize here, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, particles to particles, right? That's all we get. We start with <clears> particles, <throat> we produce all this beautiful stellar structure, it all dies, and we're left with just particles again. So the universe is not cyclic in this picture. It's sort of a one-shot deal. It starts dense in the form of particles, basically. It forms all this interesting complexity and structure, and then that goes away. And we're left with this very empty, very dark final chapter. Now, instead of having the universe repeat itself, um, one thought, and I think Sean will say more about this later, is that we have this picture of a multiverse where you have different regions of space-time going through this evolution in its own, each in its own way. And that's, I think, well, you can draw the picture different ways, but that's the sort of modern view of cosmology. So. To summarize um, what we talked about on Friday, we have this timeline of the, of the physical universe in the future. And one of the things that I emphasized was that by studying the physics of the future universe, we actually, in some sense, are doing science because we're learning things about the physical universe of today. And what I want to do for the first part of the talk today is go through that in some detail and tell you some of the physics that we learn about today's universe that was motivated in some sense informed by the physics of the future universe. So that gets us to today's um, outline. Um, the topics that I want to cover today are the first that I mentioned on Friday that we didn't have a chance to tell you about, namely why stars become red giants. Now we know, and we have known for a long time, that stars do become red giants, because you can see them in the sky. So the um, observers have pieced together the fact that stars become red giants. And when we were able to do stellar evolution codes in the 60s, starting in the 60s, we were able to make our stellar evolution codes produce stars that are red giants. So it's not that we don't have any clue about red giants. But if you take your average astronomer and give him a piece of chalk, or her a piece of chalk, and say, go to the blackboard and derive for me why a star becomes a red giant. There's probably nobody in the room that would really want to jump up and do that. Right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you how to do that. Okay. Mass of hydrogen less than infinity? What's that? Ma the mass of hydrogen is less than infinity. You have a finite amount of hydrogen? Well, that's um, one piece, but why does that make a star big? Why doesn't it just crumble into an ember? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> See, it's a little more complicated yeah, exactly. than that. And what I'm going to do for the next few minutes, um, once I get through the introduction here, is tell you what some of those complications look like. 
Now, another thing that we talked about a little bit that I want to come back to is that we can define the mass of a galaxy by looking at the future. The mass of galaxies today is not defined, but we can define the mass of a galaxy by looking into the future. And I want to say a little bit more today about what that thing tells us about structure formation today. Now, once we've established or we've adopted this point of view that we're not the only universe, then there's this possibility that um, not only could there be other universes, but the laws of physics could be different in each of those universes. So if the laws of physics are slightly different, and when I say the laws of physics are different, what I mean is that the masses of the particles or the strength of the four forces could be different in each of those little regions of space-time. So if that's the case, you can ask questions like, will each region of space-time have stars or not? <coughs> or how far can you change the laws of physics before you can no longer have stars? Of course, the multi-million dollar question isn't whether you have stars or not, but whether you can actually have life. And here, um, I'm going to save us all a couple hours by answering David's question before he asks it. I'm only going to do the physical part of it <laughs> because I don't know enough about life to answer what you're going to ask me. Um, but I will take one step in that direction. Um, now, along with the fact that the laws of physics could be different in different regions of space-time, once we're going into the future, there's another issue, namely, the laws of physics could actually change within our own space-time. We know, for example, that the strength of the gravitational constant is more or less constant on Hubble time scales, the current age of the universe. In fact, we think it's constant on time scales of about a thousand times the current age of the universe. And I don't know the exact number, depending on which experiment you believe, but it's of that order. But we're talking about time scales that are much longer than a thousand times the current age of the universe. So that gives us the possibility that the laws of physics within our own universe could be time dependent. And I'm just going to give you one little example of what happens to stellar evolution in this case, for that case. Okay? Now, I'm going to close by going through the fact that even though we've talked about some wildly long-term physical processes, there are even more wild and even more longer-term physical processes that we could talk about. And I think that puts us into a perspective about what the future of the universe means. And then I want to close with some discussion. Since we took two and a half hours on Friday, my goal is to get through this a little bit sooner. So the lecture will be a little bit shorter, so we'll have some time for discussion. But we'll see how this goes, OK? So topic one, how do stars become red giants? Well, this is the plot I showed you on Friday, which is the HR diagram of low mass stellar evolution. So these tracks are calculated computationally. We use the stellar evolution code with updated opacities and all the other bells and whistles to just numerically calculate the time evolution of stars. And what you see is that, um, just to remind you, power is plotted on the um, vertical axis and temperature is plotted backwards on the horizontal axis. So when a star evolves, it gets brighter. And it can do two things. It can either become a red giant, which means it goes off to the right and goes up and you see this star here is doing that. Or it can become bluer, which means it moves to the left. And if it moves to the left, it does not go up. So the beauty of this particular diagram is that we found that the low mass stars don't become red giants. They become blue dwarfs instead. So a star like the 0 0.1, 0 0.12 solar mass star never gets big. It never gets red. It just gets bluer and bluer and bluer until it reaches its optimum blueness, and then it becomes a white dwarf with nearly the same mass. So the point is that by studying these stars that don't become red giants, we can actually understand what it takes for a star to become a red giant. And the reason why the future of the universe plays into this is that, to remind you, if you look at the inset, the time scale of the, main, of the um, lifetime of these stars is measured in, a, in trillions of years, right? So most of this has not happened yet. We need to study the future in order to understand the evolution of low-mass stars, the long-term evolution of low-mass stars. And we need to understand the evolution of low-mass stars to understand why it is that higher-mass stars become our giants. And this is all leading up to something that um, we'll let Sean go to his class and put on the blackboard the reason for a star to become a giant. So let me show you one more HR diagram. 
to make one more point. This is the complete evolution of a Poisson solar mass star. So we can actually now, for the first time, write down all the time scales. So this is actually very powerful. <coughs> if you start way up here at the top of what's called the Hayashi track, <coughs> that's when the star gets formed. Time to make a star is about 10 to 5 years. So that's almost instantaneously compared to the other time scales that we're talking about. The length of the Hayashi track is the time it takes for the star to contract from its initial size down to a state where it can burn hydrogen. One of the things that's not obvious is that when a star is born, it actually doesn't know in advance that it's supposed to have the configuration to burn hydrogen. So stars are born not burning hydrogen. They have no idea that they're supposed to do that. They're formed with a given configuration, and then they contract down until they reach a point where they do burn hydrogen. Now, some of them fail. That's why they become burn dwarfs. There's not enough mass, then you don't have enough mass to instigate nuclear fusion, then you become a brown dwarf instead of a star. So the time to go from this formation stage down to the main sequence, as in the hydrogen burning stage, is about 10 million years for these kind of low mass stars. Then you can see the timeline, and then takes um, 5,742 gig years to evolve from there up to there. And that's when you first develop a radiative core. And the reason why this is significant is the following. If you take the sun, it actually has only has access to about a tenth of its stellar material. So the main sequence lifetime, the time that which the star, the sun as a star, will burn, is given by we'll burn hydrogen. What's up? Will burn hydrogen. Oh, what, did I say so? No, you just said will burn, but of course you're going to later on talk about. Oh yes. Oh right, right, right. So actually, it might be useful. Just to emphasize that that upper dash line is main sequence. That's where stars are burning hydrogen. Yes. And ZAMS means zero age main sequence. That's when the star joins the main sequence. Right, right. We, we know this stuff, but most of the audience doesn't. Oh, okay. Us. We're pointing out that that's your starting point. Right, right. So, as Joel said, ZAMS starts with, stands for zero age main sequence. And there's a sequence in this diagram that corresponds to um, the configuration that a star must have in order to happily burn nuclear fuel. And by burning nuclear fuel, here I mean hydrogen fusing into helium. And the location of the diagram will be mass dependent. So lower mass stars will be down here, and as you go to higher mass stars, when they're first starting out, they'll go up that dash line. Now the point I was making is that if you take a star like the sun, it only has access to about a tenth of its nuclear fuel. So that means, in some sense, it could only be the part that's in the center. Yeah, the 10% the, the, the in the middle, right? It burns in the middle, not on the outside. And that means that its lifetime is compromised over what it might optimally be, because it only has access to 10% of its fuel. Now, this star is 0.1 solar masses, so it is a tenth of the solar mass. But it has access to almost all of its fuel. And the reason is that it remains convective for 5,742 billion years, which is a kind of long time. <laughs> and during that time, it cycles all the material from the surface down into the core where it can be burned. So whereas a solar mass star only has access to a tenth of its fuel, a 0.1 solar mass star has access to 99% of its fuel, which is almost the same amount of fuel. So that is another reason why not only do the low mass stars live longer, but they live even longer than you think they would. Previous people have not done the stellar evolution calculations. They just did some sort of back of the envelope scaling. But unless you do the actual calculation, you don't know what fraction the star is actually accessible. And here it's, you know, 99% of it. So what you see is that, if you look at these diagrams here, the hydrogen abundance plummets and the helium abundance grows until it's almost a pure helium star at the end of its lifetime. And what that means, if we come back to um, this plot, I showed you on Friday that the overall luminosity of the galaxy is relatively constant until star formation starts to peter out at this corner up here. But part of the reason that the luminosity of the galaxy can remain so robust is that the lower, lower mass stars, which are living for these trillions of years, have access to almost all of their fuel. <coughs> The other point that I'd like to make that I didn't have time to emphasize on Friday is that if you ask the question, when does cell evolution take place? 
in the history of the universe? The answer is we've just started. Today, only 0.1% of the stellar evolution that will take place has taken place yet. So almost all of the stellar evolution in our um, universe will take place in our cosmological future, not in our cosmological <coughs> past. Sorry, is that 0.1% by mass or by time? Oh, this is basically in terms of the number of um, hydrogens that will be fused into helium. And you could do the measure a couple of different ways. And you can get slightly different numbers. But however you do it, what you will find is that almost all of the stellar evolution that we're ever going to have is in our cosmological future and not in our past. In other words, we're just getting started. Most of the stellar evolution that will take place lies ahead. So now, with all of that, let's get back to the um, question of red giants. So I showed you those tracks. Could you just go back to your previous slide? Because people may not have read this off. I remember uh, uh, when I, I, Peter Bodenheimer's name was not on this, but he had something to do with it. Because I remember he was very excited to be telling me, hey, the galaxy is going to get brighter. And it's going to get brighter for a long time. So uh, that 11 is a uh, 100 billion years. Yes. And so practically for a trillion years, the galaxy gets brighter, not quite a trillion. Right. Brighter than it is today? A little bit. But, um, so, yeah, but, but the point is it's basically pretty You constant. get brighter instead of dimmer. You think it's just going to plump because everything else, is, all the big stars are dying off. But as the big stars die off, the little stars get brighter, and they don't go away. And they have access to all this fuel. So all those things conspire. To give credit to people, um, Peter Bodenheimer and Greg Laughlin and I were the ones who did the actual stellar evolution calculations. So that's why Peter was all excited about that. This particular plot was made by Jennifer Graves, who was a student here at Santa Cruz, who did a summer project with Laughlin that ended up making this plot. And that's why Peter's not on this plot. But he was, of course, the precursor to much of this work with me and Graves. So we would give credit to all of those folks. And yes, Adam? Yeah, just to make sure I'm reading this correctly. Um, so a red dwarf's been lived for, what, six trillion years. Or more. Or more. Tens so, of trillions of years. Tens of trillions. This is all for solar opacity. As the universe gets older and you get more metals, then that means the cross-sectional interaction of the photons in the star will be even bigger, keeping the lid on the radiation, keeping the star dimmer, and making it live even longer. So, so what you're saying is a, a red dwarf alive today, I'm reading this yes. plot correctly, will still be alive in, in all likelihood by the time we get very close to the right-hand side of that chart? That, my friend, is the point. So yes, thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to slow you yeah. down, right? just at this point, because I think people... Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, see, one of the, the, the reasons to study the future is that it really puts things into a different kind of perspective. Right? And one of the other things that, you know, is sort of amazing if you think about it, is that stars come in a variety of masses. So a 10 solar mass star will live, die, and blow up in about 10 billion years. The sun, which is the one we like best, will live, die, and not blow up, but become a giant and then straight away in a order of 10 billion years. And then the red dwarfs will do their thing, which we're describing now, over 10 trillion years. So the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion is huge, right? Just think of it in dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> So why is there a knee there? Why is it so sudden the transition? Ah, because star formation ends. The gap, the, well, we had to, we had to put this into the model, but as we talked about on Friday, the um, galaxy can only produce stars as long as it has raw material to do so. The raw material is hydrogen gas. So eventually, the, the galaxy will literally run out of gas. And once it runs out of gas, you can make no more stars. And once the universe is old enough that these little stars start to die off, you get this corner. So it, it, it corresponds to, well, it's a trillion years, which is not a coincidence, right? Okay, so um, moving forward, for the tracks that I showed you on the Hertzberg Russell diagram earlier, what I'm now plotting here is the radius of the stars versus time. Don't worry about the units, just put it in some units so that I can put them all in the same plot. Now what you notice is that for each mass of star, you get quite a different behavior. If you look at a star that's a quarter of the sun, 
it goes along at a constant radius, and then the radius shoots through the roof. If you look at a 0.1 solar mass star, it just stays small and eventually decreases a little bit. So you see that there's markedly different behavior from some stars and others. The ones on the left become more giants, the ones on the right become blue dwarfs. And in order to stand, understand the phenomenon of red giants, we want to look at the stars here, in this mass range here, that are on the border, and see what makes them tick. See if we can go into the star, monkey around with the laws of physics, and make them either become red giants or blue dwarfs by turning knobs. Theoretically, of course. And this gives us an understanding for what it takes to make a star into a red giant. So what we're going to do is an exercise like that. <clears throat> so this is not obvious, but this is what we do. In the photosphere of the star, which is an outer layer, there's something called opacity. Opacity is something that astronomers make up to confuse physicists. But what it means is the cross-section of interaction of the radiation with the stuff, in this case the gas in the photosphere. So what I'm plotting here is a plot of the amount of um, interaction you get, which is the opacity, as a function of the temperature and density in the photosphere. And you see that, that there's a sort of crude grayscale background. So dark means lots of interaction, and light means transparent. So if you're in the light region, the light can just go through. And if you're in the dark region, the light can't go through, right? So you see that if the lighting is OK, you see there's sort of a horseshoe of darkness. And then there's a little bay of lightness. The and density the, is just the average density of the whole star? What was that? The density is the average density of the whole star? Oh, no, no. This or is the, the outer layer where outer the, layer. Yeah, this is the photosphere. So this is the outer layer where all the, the last mm -hmm. interactions. So it's the last couple of optical depths, if you will. Which is where the last. It, is, it, imagine you have a star and you have a lid on it. And it's the opacity and hence the density and temperature in that lid. And that lid is what we call the photosphere. Okay? More or less. So, what we're then doing is we're plotting the tracks of the stars in this diagram as a function of time. And you see that they all kind of live on the boundary between dark and light. So what that means is that the star can't operate if its photosphere gets too dark, if it gets too interactive, if its opacity gets too high. So what we can do is we can take the star that's right on the border between becoming red giant and not becoming red giant, and instead of using the real opacity based on the Los Alamos opacity tables or painstakingly produced and whatnot, we're just going to make one up, okay? And what we'll make one up is we'll have have this exponential temperature dependence. And then that gives me a knob to turn. I can make the temperature dependence of the opacity be hard, or meaning the interaction varies very sensitively with temperature. Or I can make it soft, in which case it doesn't vary much with temperature. The opacity doesn't vary very much with temperature. So I can turn that knob up and down. So for the same star, everything else the same, what I see is that if I turn the knob to make the opacity independence hard, the star becomes a red giant. This is the HR diagram. Right? So red giant is one that goes like this. And if I make the opacity wall, as I call it, soft, which means I make the temperature dependence weak, I become a blue dwarf. So once you're at the opacity boundary that we looked at here, if the temperature dependence as I go to the temperature dependence of the capacity as I go to larger values becomes steep, then I have to become a red giant. Now, that's only the first step. Let's see if we can now construct a simple blackboard argument for why you become a red giant. Okay? Could I just? Yes, you may. <laughs> the thing that's puzzling me is this. Uh, these stars uh, are still in their hydrogen burning phase. They have therefore not even begun to fuse helium, and they certainly haven't made any heavy own. In fact, they, the will never, they will never burn helium. Exactly. So the opacity uh, must be coming from some assumed metallicity. Well, there's um, a. Yes, go on. So what are you assuming? 
And maybe it's just current holicity, because if the stars have formed, then they're, they're forming out of the stuff that's here now. The point is that the heavier elements, what we call metals, are the origin of the opacity, most of it. Oh, well, it's a little more complicated than that. <clears throat> I see where you're going, though. So let me try to explain. Um, the opacity has um, many sources, right? So you can have the opacity of interaction with just electrons. You can, and also, there's like free free opacity and down free opacity, and then there's the heavy element opacity. So you are correct that the heavy element opacity is an important contributor. But if you have any star, whether it's a solar mass star today or an M dwarf in the future, <laughs> the metals in the photosphere are those that the star inherited at birth. Exactly. You are not actually generating those heavy elements in the star itself and then moving them to the photosphere. Any actual production of heavy elements actually only happens later in, at later stages, and it also does not generally move those elements from the core to the photosphere. And I'm only talking about photosphere capacities here. So even though everything you said is correct, I don't need to worry about it, <laughs> because those extra elements only, the only extra elements I need are those that I originally inherited. Now, to answer your question, what we've assumed for this particular exercise is that the red dwarfs, all of the red dwarfs on these plots, have solar metallicity. Okay, that's what I was asking. Right. Now, in the future, the metallicity, the metal content of the galaxy will increase. And as it increases, you'll get more and more opacity. And that will mean that um, the stars will actually live longer and longer. So the 10 trillion years is actually a lower number. And to do this right, one has to like redo the whole Los Alamos opacity tables for really high metallicity, and that's like a lifetime's work, so we haven't done that yet. But one could. Okay, so um, let me now give you a simple, what was supposed to be a simple argument for why a star would come through a giant, okay? Based on first principles, okay? So, um, one thing you have to understand is the boundary condition, which is this equation here. The luminosity of the star is equal to the surface area times the flux given by its temperature. Okay? That's a simple equation. Now, all stars become brighter as they get older. They just do. Now, you can understand why they do. The answer is basically because of um, high school chemistry. Now, the way a star works fundamentally is that gravity is pulling it inward and has to be supported by pressure. Now, as you remember from high school chemistry, the amount of pressure you get depends on what stuff is doing the pressure. So if you have big things like helium, you get less pressure at the same temperature than if you have little things like hydrogen. So what does the star do? It burns its hydrogen into helium. It converts hydrogen into helium. It converts little things into big things. So as a star converts little things into big things, it's losing pressure. No way around. And because it's losing pressure, it has to compensate. So that means the core of the star has to get hotter to support the same amount of mass. But if the core is hotter, that means the nuclear reaction rate will go up. And if the nuclear reaction rate goes up, the star becomes brighter. So because of high school chemistry, all stars become brighter because they're doing what stars do, namely turning hydrogen into helium. So every star faces what I call a luminosity problem. L, on the left-hand side of this equation, gets large. The older the star is, the larger it gets, the worse the luminosity problem gets. Okay? So that means something's got to give. The star has to evolve. The star has to change its structure. Now, it has basically only two choices. Because that's constant, that's constant, that's constant. Only in Indiana can you change pi. So you can only change the radius or the temperature. So the star has two routes to solving this luminosity problem. It can keep its radius the same and make the temperature bigger, in which case it becomes a blue dwarf, because blue is hot. Or it can keep its temperature the same and make its radius big, which becomes, in which case it becomes a giant, which we call a red giant. So there's only two routes to solve the luminosity problem. So the key question is, which one does it do? Well, what we've argued is that if the photosphere has this sensitive dependence on temperature, 
if the opacity of the photosphere is the sense of independence and temperature, then you'll become a red giant. So you can put equations to this, and this is what you should do when you go to Blackboard to explain your class. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's only a couple of equations. Um, the first is, and I'm just going to go through the schematic, so you don't worry. Um, the first is that you have to have a certain temperature gradient in order to push out the material or push out the radiation that you're producing to pr produce out the power, to push out the power. Second, the star has got to be in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means the temperature gradient has to give you a pressure gradient, which supports the star against gravity. You combine those two, and you get a simple formula. And then I'm going to write the opacity in schematic form. So there's an index that tells me how sensitive the opacity is on the temperature. Then I'm going to do a page of algebra, which I'm not going to subject you to. And you get these formulas. Delta T over T equals this set of indices times delta L over L. And delta R over R equals a different set of indices times delta L over L. So remember what we're doing here. We're increasing the luminosity. So delta L over L is getting big. The question is, does the R get big? Or does the T get big? Does it become a red giant? Or does it become a blue dwarf? Well, it all depends on this index omega. If omega is large, then on the left-hand side I have an omega in the bottom and none on the top. So if omega is large, delta T over T doesn't change, but the radius changes, and I become a red jump. If omega is small, then I become a blue dwarf. And these equations are all you need to understand, at least in part, why stars become red giants. Yes? I noticed from the previous graphs that uh, it seems to happen somewhere between 0.12 and 0.14, maybe 0.13. What happens to a star that's right on the edge? How does it know if it was one way as opposed to the other way? Well, um, it depends on details. So it's a little more complicated than what I've gone painted because I'm trying to give you a simplified version. But, um, so two things. One, if you're a star, that, if the star is in the mass range that's sort of in between, some start up the red giant branch and then have to peter out and turn around and become blue dwarfs. So they're kind of like failed red giants. So there are stars that are not so clearly on either side of the border. Second, other factors that we're not taking into account, like the rotation speed of the star and so on, will actually play a role. So you can have a whole collection of stars with the same mass a slightly different metal content, slightly different rotations and such, and they can behave slightly differently. So there's a whole wonderful set of complications that one can consider. So I didn't really want to go there today. But the point I wanted to make is that this page, which actually tells us a lot about how ordinary stars work in the universe today, is really motivated by our studies of the future universe. And we wouldn't have even thought about this unless we consider time scales of tens of trillions of years, which is a thousand times longer than the current age of the universe. So we've learned something about stars. Even if you did follow all the algebra, you should take away from this the fact that we can, in fact, understand something about stellar structure from this um, exercise. And the exercise is directly motivated by studies of the future. So I have to go back now to social topics. And to go back now to the question that we um, asked before, and I want to raise a few new points. Um, as I said um, on Friday, if you look at galactic halos today, there's not a well-defined mass, right? And the reason why is that if you look at a picture of the galaxy or the celestial structure today, there's not a well-defined outer edge to a galactic halo the outer edge of the galactic halo merges into what is commonly called the cosmic web of structure. And it's not clear exactly where the boundary of what's going to be in the halo is and the boundary of what's not going to be in the halo. Now, because the universe is accelerating, um, if you wait longer into the future, each bound structure in the universe today becomes its own little isolated island universe in the future. And last time I showed you this plot, so I made the point that cosmologists today use proxies to define the mass of the galaxy. And each of these mass proxies is varying with time. 
A is the scale factor of the universe, which there is a time. But in the near future, they all flatten out and become constant. So you should probably remind people that 1 is today. Yeah, so the scale factor has a value of 1 today. So when A is 10, the universe is 10 times larger. And when A is 100, the universe is 100 times larger. And that's, all as, that's as far into the future as we need to go for this exercise. Now, there's another thing that I didn't have time to talk about on Friday that I want to bring up. In today's cosmology, this is more in the actual literature of cosmology than in the universe. Um, people have discovered, starting with Navarro, Frank, and White in 1997, I believe, that galactic halos have a nearly universal form. In other words, if you take all the halos in the simulations that these guys do, you can look at little ones and big ones and all over the universe. They all have the same form. They just differ in scale. Now, the universal form that they have has almost this form. It's got a ronin on top, an r, 1 plus r squared. Here I have a 3. The canonical universal form that is in the literature in 1997 has a 2 here. <coughs> now, in the cosmo cosmological world, this is a big deal. Because Navarro, Frank, and White showed that there's a certain universality. Namely, if you have whole dark matter making halos, you always get the same form. And the form is this formula with a 2 instead of a 3. So maybe you said this, but it's important to know what is C? C is the radial variable in dimensionless form. So it's R over RC. Where RC is? RC is a scale, Something. which varies from different halos are different sizes. So, you know, basically, it's not true that all <coughs> galactic halos are the same size. What it says is that if you scale the radius and you scale the density scale, then you can pop them all on top of each other and you get a nearly universal result. Right? So, to put it explicitly, uh, R sub S is what they call it, the scale radius. Yeah. Is uh, where the halo switches over from being r to the minus 1 on smaller scales to r to the minus 3, or the way you wrote it, r to the minus 4 on larger scales. Right. So it's a switchover point. Right. To be careful, if you have the 2 there instead of the 3, then the switchover point is exactly what you just said. Yes. If you have the 3 there instead, there's another factor in that. So. Right. And also, if but you it, have the 2 there, in fact, the total mass is in there. Right, right, right. Which is part of the problem. Um, now, I want to emphasize that Navarro, Frank, and White did nothing wrong. Because what they did is they stacked all their halos, they looked at them in the present time, and they looked at the density profiles of halos only, only over a very narrow range. So on this plot here, you have R over R200, right? They only looked at the density profile from about here to about here. And over that limited range, their fitting formula works really good. And the fact that there is universality is, in fact, a very, very, very important result. But here's the thing. Since they wrote that paper, there's an order of 1,000 papers written to explain that particular form. OK? Now, what we showed on Friday was that if you just let the computer run into the future, you don't get a 2 here. You get a density profile that has a 3 here. And this actually makes perfect sense, because of what Joel just said, that in the future, each structure becomes isolated. The mass has to be finite. It couldn't be a 3, otherwise you would get could be a 2. Oh, it could be a 2, rather. Otherwise, it would be a log logarithmically divergent mass. So you know it has to bend over to something steeper. The fact that it's almost exactly Three is just good luck, really. But what it means is that those thousand papers that are written to explain the NFW profile are somewhat misguided because the NFW profile with a two in that formula is actually not the final state. It's merely a transient that looks like that today because the galaxy is not quite done forming. Once you've taken the evolution into the future, you can see what the asymptotic form of the halo really is. So the answer, the question you should ask is not why do you get an NFW profile. The question you should ask is why do you get this profile. So all of the explanations that explain the NFW profile 
are, they're not wrong, but they're not really telling us much because that's not actually what the answer is. Is there an answer? I mean, I presume if you wait infinity years, the halo goes backward. Well, if you wait forever, then the dark matter particles will evaporate and some will be hoovered up by compact objects and evaporate and, or annihilate inside and so on. So, but there's an intermediate asymptotic range where the halos will have a well-defined form, namely this one, and before they evaporate. So you reach this asymptotic form relatively, relatively quick in the future, just when the universe is 10 times bigger than it is today, and we're getting there exponentially fast now that we're accelerating as you of all people well know, right? This is your business, right? So you know that. And you're not going to um, <clears throat> annihilate and compromise the halo because of loss of dark matter particles till 10 to the 20 something years. So you have this long period of time from when the universe is 10 to the 11 years old to 10 to the 25, let's say, when you're going to have this nearly universal form. OK, so my point was that by looking at the future, we actually recast what questions one should ask about present day cosmology. In this case, instead of asking why I get a density profile of a two here, I should be asking why I get a density profile of a three here. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, R200 is usually taken to be the edge of the halo. So, right, uh, you're talking about the density profile of a halo, you're talking about the region inside R200. So, well, no, there's no edge at R200. It's a rough calculation based on top hat collapse, right? You know, well, uh, it's just right. a scale. It's a no, no, it's, it's 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 the radius at which yeah, it's the, a the thing will be realized. No, it's simply the top radi hat collapse. It's the radius at which the density within that radius is two hundred times okay. the background. Two hundred is not arbitrary. Though. There's a calculation for that. Well, there's a reason why they use two hundred instead of two million or two. Yeah, but that's just a rough proxy. But there's no hard edge at that value. Yeah, of course. But. So, um, I guess you weren't here on Friday, but the point I made then was that um, you can calculate R200 or today, and hence you can calculate M200, the mass enclosed at that radius today. And that's often used as a proxy for, for block and halo masses. Once you do the calculation into the future and you actually know what the mass is, you can then relate the real mass to that mass proxy. And since everything is more or less universal, there's a well-defined transformation between M200 today and the asymptotic mass that the halo will have when it's done forming. And that factor is um, 1.95, or almost 2. In other words, the real mass of the galaxy is about twice M200 as measured today in all the cosmological simulations. So it's not a surprise that there's material outside R200. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on, um, you can look at um, why there's not a well-defined boundary today by looking at phase space. So here I'm plotting just the radial velocity as averaged over all um, particles as a function of radius. If I look into the future, where A is 100 times bigger than now, in other words, the universe is 100 times larger than at present, <coughs> You see that this phase space plot is nice and pretty and smooth. And in particular, if I look at the um, average value of the radial velocity, it's zero out to a certain radius here, where it lifts off the zero axis and becomes positive. Now, that's not an accident. What this corresponds to here, this lifting, is these dark matter particles here are being swept away from the halo by the Hubble flow, so they're not bound to the halo anymore. So the boundary between what's in the halo and what's not in the halo is well defined. It's the point right here where that velocity curve lifts off the horizontal axis. And you only have to wait until the universe is about 100 times larger than it is today before you have this well defined phase space where you can read off that edge. Of course, if you wait even longer, what you will see is that this tail will become thinner and thinner and thinner until it will shrink to a point here, right here at this edge. But if you then look at the same plot today on the upper curve, you see it's a bit of a mess. You don't know how to read the boundary. And this is just a graphical representation of what I said in words earlier, 
namely the present time, the galactic halo hasn't really decided which dark matter particles are going to be part of the halo and which are going to be swept away and not be part of the halo. So there's a bit of an ambiguity. And this is the ambiguity in terms of not knowing what the mass of the galaxies is or what it's going to be. But again, by studying the future, we can define these things and we can define the asymptotic mass of the galaxy in a completely well-defined way. But there's more. Since we have the asymptotic form of the galaxy, and this is the one that it's going to live in for most of its time, until the dark matter particles go away, you can calculate the space-time metric. So for cosmological decade 11 up to about 25, each of the island universes that I described earlier will have this particular space-time metric. Now, if A and B were zero, you would just have the sitter space, because this C is the cosmological cost of vacuum energy contribution to the metric. And alpha and beta are just non-dimensional versions of A and B, so they're really the same thing. Each different halo will have a different mass, so there'll be a different scaling. But otherwise, every island universe will have this metric. So we now actually know what that is. But there's still more. We actually want to know how these halos work. We want to know whether they're produced by an overall collapse or whether they're produced by merging. We also want to know how they evolve. To answer all of these questions, the first step, and again, this is only the first step, there's like a whole lifetime's worth of work that to be done here. But the first step is to actually understand the orbits inside these dark matter halos. And now that we have the universal form, not the present day universal form, but the asymptotic universal form that the halos will have for most of their lifetime, we can calculate orbits within these halos. Now, the reason why this is sort of an interesting thing, and I'm only going to talk about it for a couple of minutes, but the reason why this is kind of an interesting thing is that um, most of the orbital motion that will take place in the universe ever will be the orbital motion of these dark matter particles in these dark matter halos. Now, if you compare how important this is to the Kepler problem, remember when you learned freshman astronomy or physics, you learned the Kepler problem, you learned Earth goes around the sun, and it's an ellipse. And this is very important in astronomy, right? Because there's billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of planets, and they're all executing Keplerian orbits. But if you take the duty cycle of dark matter particles and dark matter halos executing orbits, and you compare that to the number of Keplerian orbits and the time that things are spent in Keplerian orbits. It turns out that the dark matter orbits are important, more important, by a factor of about 10 to the 74 or something. Which is kind of a big number. In other words, almost all the orbital motion that the universe will undergo is not the Kepler problem, but rather dark matter halo orbits. So I'm just going to spend two minutes on this to give you a flavor for yet another topic that the future of the universe is motivated. This gets pretty technical pretty fast, so I'm going to only mention it and then move on. But first, Adam. Yeah, where's the factor of 10 to 74 coming from? I mean, how are you counting this? Oh, I'm just taking the total number of things in executing orbits. So you get a huge factor of you have dark matter particles as their stars and planets. And then I'm multiplying by the time over which they will execute said orbits. And the dark matter halos live for 10 to 25 years before they start to be compromised, whereas stars only live for a trillion years. Okay. And those two things multiply to 10 to the 70 something. Okay, so. So it's kind of a kludgy number. Yeah. But the only point is that it's large. Yeah, I mean, are, are, are you counting, so you're counting individual dark matter particles on one side and yes. one planet as an object on the yeah. other side? Yeah. Like a star? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Should you still count every atom in the planet? Yeah, that's very <laughs> what, What's that? Shouldn't you count every atom in the planet? Well, you could do that, and you would get a different number. I'm only doing this to, make, to, to be in fact, right? You're not meant to take the 10 to the 74 too seriously. Only that there's a whole lot of orbital stuff going on. And um, I was doing that as a way to motivate why I'm going to tell you about orbits for the next few minutes, okay? So, if you have one of these halos, um, and you make it triaxial, so it's not spherically symmetric. The miracle is that you can write down the potential in the force terms analytically. 
But analytically is sort of a misnomer because it's still a bit of a mess. <laughs> but you can write it down. Now, so there it is. You don't need to. Yeah. Are you assuming that the triaxiality, that is the axis ratio, is independent of radius? For this formula, yes. I thought so. Yes. If that's not the way halos actually look. Well, no, I know there's a complication. This is the first step. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming the constant um, right. set of axis ratios. So it's remarkable that you can make it on Right, right. So once you have this, um, to actually get orbits, you have to numerically calculate things moving through the potential with these force terms and whatnot. But since you have the analytic form for the potential and the force terms, it's pretty easy to do. And just to show you the kind of orbits you got, you have this whole gallery of orbits, right? So this is a phase space plot on the left, and this is a function of the kind of orbits that you get on the right. Now, you get tube orbits and box orbits and all kinds of different behavior. So this is sort of um, a common feature of triangle systems. The one I like in the middle is this one, which looks like a fish. So we call it a fish orbit. As Peter Goldreich likes to say, Newton's laws have more solutions than most people realize. <laughs> so you can actually have a bona fide classical physics orbit that looks like a fish. Now, if you keep looking at it, look at it very carefully. <laughs> and it looks even more like a fish, right? So, just following this even further, once you've studied these orbits, what you find is there's a very powerful orbit instability. So, if I start a dark matter particle or any test particle in one of the principal planes of the solution, or of the system, here I have the XE plane, and I get a box orbit in the XE plane. The particle, or the orbit, is unstable to motion in the perpendicular direction. So on this plot, I'm plotting the perpendicular coordinate, and you see it grows exponentially with a lot of noise. So there's an orbit instability. Now, you might be confused saying, well, why doesn't that happen in my everyday experience? And if you have a solar system, then you have a spherical symmetric system and you have conservation of angular momentum and that conservation lock is a symmetry which keeps you from moving out of the plane. But if you have a triaxial system, you don't actually conserve angular momentum, which means that you can move out of the plane. And under the right circumstances, you do. So the study of this orbit instability has led to about 10 papers which I'm not going to tell you about. I'm only going to mention that in order to understand this orbit instability, you have to invent new mathematics. Because it's described by what's called a stochastic version of Hill's equation. Hill's equations are well studied in mathematics. Those of you who had a very advanced undergrad mathematical physics course probably did them at the very end. Most of you who had that course actually didn't get to that chapter at the end, but it's there. Um, but this is a stochastic version of it. So I looked across the street to my friend Tony, who is the head of the math department at Michigan, and I said, well, how do you solve these problems? And he said, well, we haven't developed a method yet. And um, this was in 2007, so in the intervening six years, we have about 10 papers that write down the basic theorems for how this instability works. So that takes us quite far afield, and I'm assuming you guys are not interested in math. I'm not going to talk about that further, only to mention that these new effects and even the new mathematics that describe these effects are in fact motivated by studies of the future of the universe. For today, what I want to do is switch gears again. So we've had this possibility of different universes. So one of the key questions is if different regions of the multiverse have different laws of physics, how likely is it for life to develop in each one of those? Now that question turns out to be enormously complicated. So what I'm going to do is a very, very, very limited first step in that direction. So I'm going to ask the question, if I have other universes with other versions of the laws of physics, which ones of them allow for stars? You can put further constraints, you know, which ones allow for habitable planets, which ones allow for biological evolution, which ones allow for you to develop. But I'm only going to ask the question, which ones allow for stable, long-lived hydrogen, or equivalently, hydrogen-burning stars? So, the general um, 
point of view, we're going to take this as follows. What I want to do is, I'll, to answer this question, is I want to build a robust stellar model. And by robust, I want to be able to vary certain parameters by 10 orders of magnitude from the values in our own universe. In order to do that, I want a very simple model. So I'm giving away some accuracy <coughs> at the expense of simplicity. So I'm going to build an analytic model of stars. I can use what's called a polytropic model to explain the um, mechanical structure. And I'll say what that means um, in a minute. I can limit to only one kind of particle that's burning. You should think protons, but in other universes it might not be. Right? And the most important thing I have to define is what am I going to allow to vary? Now, if you ask, well, how can the laws of physics vary? You could spend your entire life just writing down all the possibilities, right? So my first thought was that the thing to do is to keep the masses of the particles in each bar and C and everything essentially the same, but allow the relative, the, the dimensional strengths of the four forces, remember those four forces of nature. So we want to let the, um, the strengths of each of the four forces vary. So gravity can be weaker or stronger. The electromagnetic force can be weaker or stronger. The nuclear forces can be weaker or stronger. Now it turns out that when you actually look into the guts of how stellar evolution works, the weak nuclear force <coughs> and the strong nuclear force basically conspire to give you a nuclear burning reaction rate. It also depends on the electromagnetic force, but that you can scale out. The part that depends on nuclear forces is a combined weak and strong force. So I'm only going to vary three things. So, so you're assuming gravity unification? Essentially. Um, I, don't have to, I don't actually have to say those words to do the calculation. But to, 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 to believe in your world view and be consistent with this calculation, the answer is yes. I think is the, this is the way to answer that. So I'm only going to vary G, which is gravity, alpha, which is the fine structure constant, which determines electromagnetism, so it's essentially the charges. And then C is a combined constant that sets the strength of nuclear reactions. And you'll see how that plays out. So all I'm going to do in this, and again, m many of you, especially David will find this highly unsatisfying, because I will go one tiny step in the direction of what you want to know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I have a three-parameter parameter space. I'm just going to write down the boundaries. Where do I get stars? Where do I not get stars? Now, once you've done that, as we'll talk about in about 10 minutes, there's a whole lot of other things one could do, but I'm not planning to have done them. Okay? So, um, you can't do stars without writing down the stellar structure equations. So, stars are driven by four equations the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, conservation of mass, conservation of energy or energy generation, and the transport of said radiation. You have to account for how the radiation transfers through the stars. Um, don't worry about the exact form of these equations. I'm only trying to give you a flavor for how we build this total model. In addition to specifying the equations of stellar structure, there's three ancillary relations. You have to have an equation of state, which tells you how much pressure you have for a given density of temperature. You have to have an opacity, the same kind of opacity we talked about earlier, which tells you how much interaction you get between the radiation fields and the matter. And finally, you have to have an energy generation scheme, which tells you how the nuclear reaction works, or if you have a different um, energy source, how that energy source works. So we can simplify this enormously by separating the mechanical structure of the star from the radiative structure of the star. And you do that by saying the pressure depends only on density, not on temperature. In order for that to be consistent, there's an implicit, implicit temperature dependence. And this is well known since James Sekar and gives you what's a well known equation called the lane Endon equation, which you can then solve to give you the run of density, pressure, and temperature in the star. And all stars have this basic form. They're dense in the middle, and the density goes to zero outside. And what we're doing, essentially, is we're imposing this basic form on the structure of the star. <coughs> and we're doing this because that allows us to um, solve for the entire problem analytically, and that allows us to vary the parameters by 10 orders of magnitude, which is not what you want to do in present-day stellar evolution. There you want to get the model as accurate as possible, because you know what the value of g is, right? But here I'm sort of giving away some approximations so that I can um, 
understand the basics better. Okay, so nuclear reaction rates work this way. Um, the cross section for interaction has this form as a function of energy. The key thing is that there's a suppression. There's a suppression due to electromagnetic repulsion. So let me just explain physically what's going on here. In the sun, or in its star, nuclei have to get close together in order to fuse because the strong force which holds them together is a short range force. Now, at large distances, the electromagnetic force is stronger. So in order to have fusion take place, you have to bash the particles together so that they're close enough to undergo fusion. In order to bash the particles that close together, you have to give them a high energy so they can overcome the electrical repulsion. Now, many physicists have done the following back to the envelope calculation. You could say, well, I know what the force is on two protons. What temperature do I need for them to get within 10 fermi of each other, which is the length scale of the, um, strong interactions, to fuse? Has anyone done that calculation? What's the answer? Uh, Well, what is it in Kelvin? <laughs> um, that's uh, 10, 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 7. 10 to the 6, so 10 to the 10. Yeah, it's a little less than that, but it's about that. The point is that the center it's of the sun... About 10 billion uh, degrees. Yeah. It's, it's a big number. And the center of the sun is not 10 billion degrees, it's 10 million degrees. Right. Again, we have the difference between a million and a billion, right? That, that's where Kelvin comes. That's where tunnel comes in, and that's the point, right? Um, the electromagnetic force keeps the particles apart and keeps them from fusing. So you don't want the star to operate such that the, te the temperature is so hot that the particles can freely overcome this Coulomb barrier or freely overcome the electrical repulsion. You want them to be repulsed. You want just the occasional really, really fast particle to overcome that barrier in a lot of fuse, right? The reason why you want this, and this is sort of one of the lessons in the whole exercise, is you want your star to be a star, not a nuclear bomb. Because if all the particles overcame the electrical repulsion, it would just blow up. It would be great for about a second. <laughs> and then you wouldn't have a star anymore, right? So the way stars operate is they are far apart and only occasionally do the particles get close enough to actually undergo fusion, and they do it through a tunneling process, as you remarked. Okay, so the cross-section for interaction has a leading factor, which depends on nuclear physics, and a repulsion factor, which depends on basically what we'll call electric physics, okay, electromagnetism. And then there's lots of help, which I'm not going to go So. Um, you have to specify the opacity in the star, and then you get a relationship, again, don't worry about the form of the equation, only the fact that we can write it down, you get a relationship that has to be satisfied at the central temperature. This theta C is a function of the central temperature. So. And then you can solve for the radius of the star in terms of these things, the luminosity of the star, and the temperature of the star, and again, I'm not worried about the exact formula, only the fact that I have it. Okay. So let's see how we're doing. So I have this simple model of a star. I should apply it to our universe and make sure that it makes sense, right? So here's the main sequence that Joel was talking about. I'm plotting the main sequence of, um, which is the power output of the star versus the temperature of the star. And the temperature of the star is plotted backwards. If you compare this main sequence to the real one, it's almost the same, except the, the curvature is a little wrong. It should bow the other way over there. But see, we're varying this over many, many, or, many, many, many orders of magnitude and luminosity, and it works pretty well. I should also remark that when I chose this polytropic model, if I go back to where I chose my polytropic model. 
there is a parameter which can either be written as gamma or gamma is 1 plus 1 over n. n is the polytropic index. I never told you what that was. Now, in stellar evolution calculations, for low mass stars, when you do the right calculation, you can show that the structure you get for the star is very much like a polytropic structure with n equals 3 halves. This turns out that way. White dwarfs are polytropic models where n is exactly 3 halves. And if you go from a low mass star all the way to a very, very large star, like a 10 solar mass star that has lots of radiation in it, the index n goes from 3 halves to about 3. So the allowed range that you want that parameter to um, live in is anywhere from 3 halves to 3. If I go back to my main sequence calculation here, there's three plots, or there's three lines on this. Um, the lower line is n equals 3 halves, the dashed one. The dotted one is n equals 3. And the one in the middle is where I've smoothly varied the index with mass from 3 halves to 3. And as far as we're concerned today, these are all the same. My point is that by choosing the polytropic model, I haven't really given away that much of the way approximations. And even though there's a little bit of ambiguity in, the, in deciding which index it is, for the purposes that we're using the model for, it's OK. Similarly, I can calculate the mass luminosity relationship. And it's the usual m cubed form. Again, if you um, have real stars, they're a little bit more complicated than that. This is a little steeper at low mass and then less steep at higher mass. The reason for the difference is that in this class of stars, I'm only considering one process where I only have one thing that's burning. So for those of you who know stellar evolution, there are two different cycles of um, processes that give us energy in the sun. There's the proton and proton chains, which are called PP chains. And that's essentially all I'm doing here. But in addition, there's something called the CNO cycle, where you have carbon and nitrogen and oxygen that act as a catalyst. And for really high, for higher mass stars, that can play a big role and change the, the dynamics of it. I'm ignoring the CNO physics in this particular model. That will give you a curvature that looks kind of like this on this diagram. Again, it doesn't affect our purpose today, but we should be sort of aware of what kind of approximations we're giving away in building these models. So, in the present universe, with the present laws of physics, you can write down um, the following mass scales. There's a mass scale which is written in terms of just fundamental constants, which is shown on the top. If I just take H or H bar and C and G and the mass of the proton, I get a mass scale which is, according to this um, set of constants, 1.85 times the mass of the sun. Now, if you think about it, that's kind of amazing. I have fundamental constants, and H's and G's, so quantum mechanics, gravity, and the mass of the proton, and I get out the mass of the sun, or the mass of stars. 1.85 times the mass of the sun is a typical stellar mass. A little on the large side, but not too crazy, right? Hold that thought. Now, I can do another calculation. I can say, well, if I have a star, and I imagine making it smaller and smaller in mass, it will get denser and denser in density. And if it gets too dense in density, then quantum mechanical degeneracy pressure will start to play a role, the same way we talked about on Friday. And once you get to the point where quantum mechanical degeneracy pressure is contributing to the pressure, it keeps the temperature from being big enough. If I posit that I need a minimum nuclear burning temperature, which I put in here, then I can calculate the minimum mass of a star that I need in order to overcome degeneracy pressure. And what I get is a bunch of constants times the same mass scale, which work out to be about 0.07 times the mass scale. This defines the lower limit of stellar masses in our universe. It's kind of remarkable you could write it down analytically. Now hold that thought and give you yet one more. There's a maximum mass scale. It's not obvious, but if you go to the limit where 
a star is 100% supported by radiation pressure instead of gas pressure, the star is unstable. So you can't make a star too large in mass, otherwise you will have too much radiation pressure and it will be unstable and it will blow itself apart. If I blow itself apart, what it'll probably do is oscillate around, lose some mass, and become a smaller star. So if you try to make a 200 solar mass star, it will very quickly say, sorry, I'm full, I'm going to be a 50 solar mass star, and get rid of that extra stuff. The exact numbers we don't know, but that's the general idea. Now you can write down equations which describe that, where F is the fraction of the pressure provided by gas pressure. And you don't want that to be less than about half, otherwise you get this phenomenon I just described. And you can calculate the maximum mass that you get out of that, which is about 56 times that mass scale. So the point of all this is that there's a fundamental mass scale of stellar evolution given by fundamental constants, which one is remarkable. Two, there's a minimum mass scale set by degeneracy pressure, and there's a maximum mass scale that's set by radiation pressure. In between, stars are actually gener are, are operating based on basically being run by ideal gas pressure. So as mundane as the ideal gas law is, it actually runs stars. Because if you have too much degeneracy pressure, the star is too small to burn. If you have too much radiation pressure, the star is too big to be stable. The range of stars that actually work as stars are those that are dominated by ordinary ideal gas law, just like we learned in high school chemistry. So high school chemistry shows up again. The other point is that in our universe, the minimum mass scale, which we could write in terms of this fundamental mass scale or just in terms of solar masses, the minimum mass scale is about 0.08 solar masses. The maximum mass scale is about 100 solar masses. So in rough terms, stars can live over three decades in mass from 0.1 solar masses to 100 solar masses. The way in which a universe can fail to make stars is basically to make the minimum mass scale bigger than the maximum mass scale. And then you're out of business, right? You didn't mention the bottom line. Oh. The... oh, well, I was going to move on, but just to, for completeness. Um, there's another mass scale which is related to the same mass scale, which is called the China Sekar mass scale. If you have a white dwarf or a neutron star, you can't make the star too large, otherwise it will blow up. In other words, if you have a star um, that's supported by degeneracy pressure, as you pile more and more mass onto it, as we saw on Friday, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But you can't keep doing that forever, because if you put on too much mass, the whole thing implodes and you get a nice explosion. The mass scale at which that happens is about 1.4 times solar masses in today's universe. It depends a little bit on the composition. But again, it's another factor that's times this fundamental mass scale. So this fundamental mass scale determines the minimum mass of stars, the maximum mass of stars, and the maximum mass of degenerate objects. And it's all just a basic, um, a mass scale given by the basic fundamental constants. So it's remarkable how far in stellar evolution you can go just with the one basic mass scale. And another question from Adam. Yeah, uh, sorry to keep bring you then, but uh, the the third equation there, uh, you've got something in the denominator of the second last term, uh, and in brackets. What is that? Oh, um, this is the mass of the proton. Yeah. This is the mean mass of the particles that make up the gas of the star. Okay. So it's basically the mass of the protons weighted by in helium you have and any electrons you have. So it's basically going to be within a factor of two of this. Since I'm only doing orders of magnitude, I ignored it in this discussion. Since I'm punctilious about such things, I wanted to put it in my equations to get right. So, so there you have it. Do you have a question there? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, you're in the light. So, <laughs> um, so, so as I say this, I feel like I may have emailed you this question at some point years ago, but so I apologize. Oh, that's fine. So, Everyone else needs to be well between. So. Uh, Back when I was a grad student, I, I did a report, and I, I, I was studying pycnonuclear reactions. Uh, right. And it seemed to me like there might be a way to get a star that was basically driven by you know, degeneracy pressure supported fusion, pycnonuclear reactions. 
Uh, and it seemed like it, they were really low mass, and it seemed like it wouldn't quite work. But I, I was curious if you could, ex if you had those reactions in here, if not, if you could extend that and see whether in these counterfactual universes there might be some room for interesting stars that were driven in that one. Ah, um, I remember your question. And I remember my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Anthony raises a very good point. Um, what I'm doing here is simply ordinary fusion. Well, not quite ordinary, but even simpler than ordinary fusion, where I have one species of particle which is undergoing a fusion-like process that's analogous to what's going on in the sun. What Anthony's pointing out is that if I have a degenerate object, so one that's failing to do nuclear reactions under the ordinary way, you then basically have the, the potentially fusing particles living in a dense lattice. And if you let the thing cool down, it'll actually be a lattice, right? And then the particles can tunnel from one lattice site to another. They don't even have to be in the lattice, but it's easier to describe it that way. And in that tunneling process, they can undergo fusion, and that will produce a little bit of energy. Um, that's another way to make a star-like thing. That's not what I'm putting on board here. Um, those stars, which could be viable, will have a very, um, well, in our universe, they will have a very low level of um, luminosity, much lower than anything stellar. If you tune all the parameters, one could imagine having that version of a star have sort of substantial luminosity. What, I, I haven't actually done the calculation, even though you suggested that to me a couple years ago, so I still should do that. Um, what you can also do is you can have more exotic stars where you have like a ball of dark matter and the annihilation gives you um, luminosity or even a black hole can play the role of stars. I'll show you one plot about that in a few minutes. But that's a very good point. But that's not what's on the board here. So um, since we're already running out of time, let me skip ahead to the actual result. So we have this model. And you can then ask, well, when do you get stars and when do you don't? So what I'm plotting here is a parameter space plot where I'm varying the gravitational constant g relative to its size in our universe by 10 orders of magnitude up and down. And then I'm um, varying the strength of the electromagnet, the electromagnetic force given by alpha, um, 10 orders of magnitude up and down the horizontal axis. So if I keep the nuclear constant, which is my third thing, constant with the value in our universe, you get the solid line. In other words, everything under the solid line, all of the parameter space under the solid line, allows for stars to exist. Now, on the right-hand side, if I have alpha too large, I basically get too much electromagnetic repulsion, and that shuts down fusion, so I can't get the tunneling I need, so I can't have nuclear I can't have sustained nuclear reactions. On the left-hand side, alpha is basically too small. And there, it's not that I can't have nuclear reactions. It's that I can't have stable nuclear reactions. The whole thing just blows up. If I make gravity too large, then the whole star will implode. So the compromise between those three things is that I have to be under this curve. The so star. That, that right-hand uh, barrier, is that basically alpha equals 1? Well, alpha equals Oh, oh, alpha equals 1. Because alpha not is 10 lines. Oh, al al alpha is 1 over 137. Right? So alpha of 1 would be... It's about where it's in. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically where E and becomes strongly coupled anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, I have not done that. Fortunately for you. Yeah, yeah, fortunately for you. Yeah, I can Good point. Um, thank you, Sean. So um, what I was going to say is that the star is where we live, right? That's just the current, the 1, 1 point, where g is the value in our universe and alpha is the value in the universe. Now you notice there's three other curves. The solid curve is for the value of c in our universe, the nuclear constant. If I make it 100 times bigger, then I get the dashed curve. If I make it 100 times smaller, I get the, the dotted curve. So I can move this triangular shaped parameter space um, region up and down by varying the C. And this is what you get. Stars exist in this fraction of um, parameter space. Now you see that 
the star lives pretty far from the boundary in our universe. So I can vary the constants by quite a lot and still get stars. There's a lot of literature that says the universe is fine-tuned and if you change just something a little bit, you don't get stars. Now, it might be that if you change things just a little bit, you don't get life. But, David, I don't know anything about life. <laughs> I only know about stars and only a little bit about stars. Um, and what I argue is that stars can live in a fairly large part of parameter space. So, here we go. The bottom line is that stars in other universes are just not as rare as sometimes claimed. So there's a, a good fraction of parameter space that allows that. Now, this is only the first set, okay? One is that you don't just want stars if you want to have a little universe. You want them to be longer lived, long enough lived. You want them to be long enough lived relative to how long life takes to develop, and those kinds of questions. And you can keep doing this. The issue, and one of the points I want to make here, is that each time you add another constraint, you have to do a calculation as rigorous as the one I just tried to do for you. So each step is a paper. And that's a lot of work. So it's sort of a whole community's lifetime's work to answer this question of how, what parameter space will really allow for habitable planets and life and all these kinds of things. Now the other thing that we don't know in physics is that I've only shown you the parameter space. I say I can vary g by factors of 100 and I get stars, still get stars. But I don't know what the probability is for getting a particular value of g. In fact, I think that's one of the, um, one of the things we as physicists would really like to know. In the 20th century, we figured out, well, we'll pat ourselves on the back and say we figured out what the laws of physics are. What we'd like to know in the 21st century is why the laws of physics are the way they are. And in particular, if the laws of physics vary from pocket to pocket within the multiverse, What's the probability distribution for having a particular value of g, a particular value of alpha, and so on? I think the answer is we just don't know. At least I will say I just don't know. Maybe some of you would like to know. <laughs> John will tell us this after yeah, dinner. <laughs> but anyway, there's an important question there. Namely, what is the probability distribution that underlies that parameter space, right? Now, we could, of course, do um, more sophisticated models, but I think given this previous issue and the relative accuracy of the model we have, that's probably not the most urgent thing to do. And then this is really Anthony's point that you can have alternate stars. You can have stars that are degenerate and run by nuclear reactions. You have dark matter stars, and you can have black holes. So just to illustrate that, I have a black hole plot for you. So suppose you want a black hole to play the role of a star. Well, you want two things. You want it to be bright. We don't know how bright you need it to be, but you want it to be bright. And you also want it to be long-lived. We don't know how long-lived you want it to be, but you want it to be fairly long-lived. So, what I did was I said that, um, just to make this plot for you, I said, well, I want the, I want the um, black hole to live for a number of atomic time scales. And then I estimated the number of atomic time scales we needed to do biological evolution, which is, you know, a billion years, basically. And then I said that that scales like alpha to the fourth power. So if I vary g, I vary the size of, uh, I, I vary the um, possible size of my black hole, and as I vary alpha, I get my time scales. So if you want a black hole to live long enough according to this very made-up criterion that I just made up for you. If you want it to have the luminosity of a star, you have to be underneath the solid curve. And by star, I mean one solar luminosity. If you just want it to be under an M, have the luminosity of an M star, you need to be under the dash curve. And if you want it to just have the luminosity of our biosphere, which as we talked about on Friday, is a, about a, a quadrillion um, watts, then you just need to be under the dash curve. So it's actually kind of remarkable that there is a black hole mass that will give us a luminosity of the biosphere and will last for a billion years. This is like uh, Hawking radiation. Yes. Now, there's the question of how you actually use the Hawking radiation and turn it into something useful because it's 
as, as Lenny talked about, its long wavelength and so on. But the mass scale you need is 10 to the 14 grams. You need it to be that small so the black hole is hot enough to radiate enough luminosity and also to, um, but it will still live long enough. So the problem is that it's probably impossible, at least we don't know how to, make such a black hole in our own universe. But it's interesting that you could, in fact, make one up in your mind that will do the job. Right? What is the temperature of that black hole? I don't remember off the top of it. It's still even very cold. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's going to be much colder than the sun. So there's the entropy problem, too. You know, how do you actually get life with such a um, yeah, you need low, low level or low grade of... Is it cold compared to the CMB? Yes. Then it's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, this is the kind of um, exercise that you could do to make exotic stars. And again, this would just sort of throw a plot. So there's like a whole program that one could do. I'm only pointing out, in the spirit of what Anthony asked, that there are more possibilities that one can consider. Now, um, instead of having different values of um, fundamental constants in other universes, there's also the possibility that you can have time varying um, you can have time varying constants in our own universe. So let me give you just a real brief example of that. Um, last time we looked at the HR diagram for a white dwarf undergoing proton decay, and we saw that it followed this track where the white dwarf gets bigger and it loses mass until it becomes about the size and mass of Jupiter, and then it gets smaller. So there's this quarter in the track. So what I want to do, just as a brief illustration, is suppose you have proton decay driving a white dwarf evolution, and you have the, the gravitational constant varying at the same time. Now, we actually don't know that the gravitational constant varies, and since we don't know that it varies, we certainly don't know how it varies. Um, so I'm just going to make something up, again, for purposes of the illustration. So we have G being a power law in time, where P is some power. If P is zero, then you get cost of G. Now there's really, and there's a time scale associated with it. So there's really three regimes. If the time scale on which G is changing is much greater than the proton lifetime, then you just get back the same answer we got on Friday. So there's no, no new work to do. If you're in the regime where the um, time scale for G changing is much less than the proton lifetime, then proton decay doesn't have anything to do with it. What will happen is that the white dwarf will just expand. It will expand at cost of luminosity, because the luminosity is given by proton decay, which is decoupled. So the track will just be a horizontal line. <coughs> that's what you get. So that's not very interesting either. Um, but if the proton decay lifetime is comparable to the time scale on which G is changing, then you get new tracks. And these are the kinds of tracks you get. So what you see is that you get a quantitative difference, but the quality, the qualitative um, track of having a shallow a corner and then a decrease is actually almost the same. But the shape of these tracks is actually pretty much the same, although the exact numbers vary when you change the um, when you change the um, <coughs> gravity as the frequency decay. So, um, one of the points, so I can switch gears in the, again and start to wrap up. Um, one of the points I made at the end of the last time was that as you go deeper and deeper into future time, <coughs> any calculation you do is necessarily going to become more uncertain. Right? So what I want to do for the next few minutes is just illustrate this point by going through a few other things that are not part of the timeline. There are other long-term processes that one could talk about, but they probably are less relevant to the future of the universe. Um, so here we go. We talked about proton decay, and we talked about basically what I would call first-order proton decay, where the proton decay process is driven by only one intermediate particle. And remember that time scales of 10 to the 33 up to 10 to the 45 years. So that's 33 to 45 plus multiple decades. It turns out that there are other channels that I didn't have time to talk about. So if you have um, a proton decay process that requires two intermediate mass or two intermediate particles, um, you can have what's called second-order proton decay, 
or even third order proton decay. And that could take anywhere from 100 to 160 cosmological decades. It's also the case that the vacuum of electroweak theory can have multiple minima, and tunneling between those minima can give you a change in baryon number. And that process, the actual tunneling solution is called sphalerone, the, that process can also drive proton decay. The time scale for that is about 141 cosmological decades, give or take. Now, most of the physics literature will say, well, if this is all you got, and the time scale is 141 cosmological decades, then they will actually say the proton is stable. They don't really mean that the proton is stable, they just mean it's so stable we don't have to worry about it. Because the next lesson is that, suppose that the proton lifetime is 10 to the 100 years. It becomes kind of hard to observe. And the reason is that there's only 10 to the 78 protons in the whole of the universe. What's that? Our current visible horizon. Right. Now I haven't counted them exactly. When you said the universe, but like now we have to do the same <coughs> Okay. The far fewer, of course, inside our event horizon. Well, in the observable universe today, that's our current horizon. Yes. There's approximately, and I haven't counted them exactly, there's approximately 10 to the 78 protons. Here we take. Okay. And um, if the proton lifetime is 100 cosmological decades, and we're only around for um, 10 to the 10 years, then the total number of decay events that happened in the whole universe over all of time is about 1 part in 10 to the 12, right? So it's going to be hard to experimentally verify something that has a lifetime of 10 to the 100 years. <coughs> In other words, you need an experiment that's 10 to the 12 times larger than the whole universe, right? So that gets kind of expensive. Another process that we did talk about is that it turns out that rocks are liquids. What is a liquid? <clears throat> a liquid is something that um, takes the shape of this container. Now, you usually think of a rock as being in the glass so that it stays put. But if you wait long enough, the molecules can move around. They can tunnel from place to place. <coughs> so that process will essentially make any solid a liquid if you wait long enough. This was from Dyson's article in 79 that Joel mentioned. And what you find is that the time scale for this is about 10 to the 65 years. Now probably this won't happen because probably proton decay will happen before this. So we don't really need to put it on our timeline. But if proton did decay didn't happen, then rocks would be liquids. But this is just the beginning. There's a lot more even longer term things we can consider. Um, there's this famous saying that may or may not have been said by Huxley, that if you put a bunch of monkeys on typewriters, eventually they'll write all the works of Shakespeare. That's all well and good, but most people don't actually go to the next step. So well, how long does it actually take for a monkey to write a play? Well, the answer depends a little bit on how you do the calculation, but um, the fastest you can do is to not worry about capital letters and punctuation, <laughs> which is pretty much the way we do emails anyway. Um, and if you do that, the time scale is 500 cosmological decades, right? So while it's true that a monkey would, in fact, write a play in 10 to the 500 years, you can also see that that would never happen. Even the high order proton decay processes, which we cannot measure, will happen long before this, right? Now, I've kind of um, cheated you a little by using cosmological decades. What you really should do is write out this number. Yeah. You should write out all 500 zeros on your piece of paper before you go around and start talking about those time scales, okay? Because monkeys really don't write plays. <laughs> But that's just the beginning. Um, another thing that can happen is that all nuclei will actually end up being iron nuclei if you wait long enough and if the protons don't decay. The reason is that the binding energy per particle has this shape here. There is actually a graph behind this picture. Um, so hydrogen loses energy when it becomes helium, and you continue to lose energy until you're in the valley of iron. <coughs> Then larger nuclei have, are less tightly bound. That's why 
when you take uranium and you break it apart, you get energy out. And when you take hydrogen and you bash it together, you get energy out. There's got to be a minimum energy state, and that's iron in the middle. So that means that if there's a way to get there, and there is through quantum mechanical tunneling, all matter will be iron if you wait long enough. And long enough is 1,500 cosmological decades. But there's more. If you have a white dwarf, and again, there's no proton decay, <coughs> then the white dwarf can tunnel into a black hole if you wait long enough. But here, if I wait long enough, I have to wait 10 to the 10 to the 76 years. So the number of cosmological decades is 10 to the 76. So again, you couldn't even begin to write down all these zeros, right? But nonetheless, you can calculate these processes. So, oh, sorry, what is the time scale for white dwarfs in the galaxy to fall into the central black hole? Probably much less than that. Oh. Well, it depends where they are. Some will never. In fact, most will never, right? Most will never evaporate. Oh, okay, so it's easier to evaporate than to fall into the. Yeah. I mean, if you take all the stars in the galaxy um, and you have a dynamical two body relaxation, most things will go out into the next larger structure and then some fraction will go in and be scattered in the black hole. There's actually not a completely honest calculation of that yet. So, if you have a student, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> then, then you also have to take into account the annihilation of the dark matter, which will steadily decrease the density of the halo. Oh yeah, over long enough times, yeah. yeah. It turns out that the two-body relaxation time is faster than the dark matter annihilation time by only a book order magnitude or two. So you could just about get away without that. But <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, the basic lesson of <coughs> what I just went through is that one can calculate a lot of long-term processes. But what often happens is that <coughs> not everything that you calculate will happen because something else happens first and blows it out of the water, essentially. In the cases that we just um, went through, what's likely to happen is that protons will decay, and that will keep nuclei from becoming iron because the proton decay time scale is so much less. Now, I have to emphasize we don't absolutely know the proton decays, but we have good reason to think it will eventually. <coughs> and finally, as one last example, at the end of well, the last lecture, we talked about tunneling events. And you can put numbers to that. So if you have a simple quartic potential, then the tunneling time scale has, well, it's the tunneling probability. If you use typical scales for the prefactor and you use order of magnitude values for the constants, you could show that the action has to be bigger than this number in order for there not to be any nucleation events within our horizon as of today. If you then say, well, what's the likelihood, likely value of this action? It can be anywhere from a half to 30,000. So 500 is kind of in the middle, right? You could imagine a very sensible potential that would give you tunneling events so that we wouldn't be here today. But you could also imagine a potential such that <coughs> the action is huge, and that would require 10 to the 12,800 years for it to decay. So that's kind of the beauty of the exponential, right? Is that you're allowed to have a very, very wide range of time spans. So to wrap up, um, I'd like to make three points before we kind of open discussion. One is that the future evolution of the universe is, is um, a very rich subject, right? Um, you can build a timeline, and then that's what we did on Friday, but then you can keep going. You can use that to motivate other studies, like understanding how stars become red giants, understanding how galactic halos work, understanding how stars in other universes might work, and so on and so forth. Um, so one of the other lessons is that by studying the universe in a different context, namely the far future, we learn a lot about how our universe today works. And that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in this topic so much. And then the other thing that I would just put in this warning, it's really fun to calculate things that take 10 to the 10 to the 76 years to do, like tunneling into a white hole. But 
as we do that, we get farther and farther from our experimental constraints. And ultimately, physics is an experimental um, endeavor. So one should be a little bit careful. Now, before we stop, um, since this is supposed to be a philosophy conference, I wrote down just four slides of questions that I thought might be interesting to the audience. So I'm just going to read through these. You as philosophers, since there are some real philosophers out there, but I think these, these are stupid, right? So you're not going to be required to talk about them, but I'm going to put them up anyway. Um, so one thing that we talked about at the beginning was that I put forward the concept of the Copernican time principle, namely saying that you know our current epoch in time isn't that special. But now that we've seen the timeline, we've discussed it for two lectures, we can come back to that question and say, well, is our current cosmological epic special, or is this principle useful or not? And then one of the questions that's come up is, you know, what happens to any calculation of the future if the laws of physics depend on time? Now, along with that, I just point out that the experiments show that um, the value of the constant, gravitational constant and the value of alpha, the electron, the fine structure constant, don't vary that much. But don't vary that much just means that we're probably good until cosmological decade 15 or so at most. After that, all bets are off. We could have time variations on longer time scales. And it's not clear how much one should worry about that, but it is a concern. And here's the, actually the question I'd like to actually pose to you guys. Um, as we go further and further into the future, we get farther and farther away from experimental confirmation or the present day universe where we, you know, we know what's what. Right? So there is this question, how far into the future can you go or before you stop doing science and start just doing speculation? Now that same kind of question really happens as we go back towards the moment of the Big Bang. And by that I mean the Planck scale in time, right? As I go further and further back in time, I have less and less experimental confirmation. Still have some, but I have less and less. And when I go back past the birth moment of the universe, whatever that means, and we talk about how we're not sure what that means, and I talk about the birth of other universes, I've kind of left experimental results behind. But at what point do I stop doing science? Right? There's sort of a general question of how far away <coughs> from experiment can you be and still be doing science? So I think that I will just leave this question up and I will open the question um, or the, the um, open things up for discussion. If any one of you would like to have an opinion about this, I would very much love to see what you have to say. But if you want to talk about something else, it's kind of it's kind of your gig, so. So. I am done. <laughs>
yeah. Can you just expand a bit on the Copernican band principle question you had before? I felt like that was passed kind of quickly. You just go back to the side. Oh, well. Well, I forgot exactly what I wrote on the slide, but the, the, the point was that I argued at the beginning of the first lecture that um, the present cosmological epoch is not the only one, right? And we tend to be very um, sort of anthropocentric, saying that, you know, when we live is the most important time. But as we've seen, you can calculate physical processes that happen on a whole host of different time scales. So the thought of the Copernican time principle is simply that um, one should, you know, not consider the present cosmological epoch as special. On the other hand, once we've actually gone through this timeline, we see that the current cosmological epoch is a little bit favorable for life to exist, right? Because we've got stars. On the other hand, we're only 0.1% of the way into the Stiletra's era when we have stars. So, does that mean that we are in a special time because we have stars, or does that mean we're not in a special time because we're only 0.1% of the way into the epoch that has stars? Or is the whole concept kind of screwy and we shouldn't be talking about it in the first place, right? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think one thing you clarify is just what you mean by special, special in what way. So when you clarify that question, like, are, are we in a section that can, can support life, then that's a more concrete question than mm -hmm. but special is a little bit. That's a good point. Um, you have a question? Or a uh, comment? Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, there are two ways you can understand this conservative principle. One is as a sort of pre-theoretic principle. You want to go into analyzing our results and forming our theories, not assuming that there's anything special about us, just as we shouldn't have gone into formulating our theories of our location in the universe and there was something special about it, even though we did. It's like, yeah. screwed up there, let's not do that again. <laughs> On the other hand, once we've you know, like, done that, once we've made a lot of observations and formed the theory, we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't think that we should go back and change the theory if it says there's something special about where we are. That seems to be a, a Different activity, right? So it's yeah. like a methodological principle that we shouldn't we shouldn't be worried about it turns out that actually Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Adam. Yeah. Um, so uh, at some point, actually I guess this was on uh, Friday, you said that you were you were something you said something to the effect of we're lucky to be living in the time that we are as cosmologists because it'd be difficult to take cosmology too far into the future. Yes. Um, have you looked at all into what cosmologists living in the future might be able to do if they work really hard? I, mean, <laughs> I, I haven't gotten any farther than thinking, okay, so if it were 100 billion years since the Big Bang instead of 13.8, we look up in the sky and we wouldn't see other galaxies. What else, I mean, what sort of cosmology would it be possible to do in, at that such a time? Well, I guess you should think in terms of the, the three pillars of Big Bang cosmology, right? There's the expansion of the universe, there's Big Bang nuclear synthesis, and there's cosmic microwave background. So in the future, after all, you know, after we basically live in what I call an island universe, where every bound structure is its own little island universe, then there's not external galaxies that are expanding away with the Hubble flow for us to look at. So we cannot use those to measure the expansion. Nonetheless, if the center space remains being the center space, which might be a big deal, things are still expanding. It's just that our halo, which will be Milky Way and Andromeda, will not be. So what cosmologists are then forced to do, if they want to measure the expansion, is you can imagine that some stars will be kicked out by two-body relaxation or whatever to high velocities of view the system. So if you have sensitive telescopes, you can look at those markers and then measure their trajectories as they move away. So there still is a way to measure the expansion. It's just a whole lot harder than it is now. And um, you could even go so far, if you were in advanced civilization, to send out markers, to send out probes beyond the halo and have them send new signals back, thereby measuring the expansion. When you, when you say expansion, you really mean the Acceleration. Yes. Is it? I mean, they couldn't. You couldn't really get any sense as to whether the universe was contracting or expanding. Well, all you 
we do is measure the trajectory of the expelled star or probe, right? And use that kinematics in, it, in, in conjunction with the laws of physics to deduce what could be, right? I haven't worked through the constraints of what we could see versus how well that constrains things. But I think you can just point out you can still live in a contracting universe with a positive cosmological constant. Say again? You can still live in a contracting universe yeah. with a positive cosmological constant. Yeah, so there might not be a unique interpretation of your observation. Are you measuring the, the lambda or something like that? You're not measuring the expansion. Right, right. So, yeah, so, fair enough. You can put constraints on the geometry of your spacetime by looking at these probes, either naturally made probes or even artificially made probes. But you can't figure out everything. So. It's much easier to do now if you just look at galaxies. <laughs> and galaxies are big and bright and we can see them. In fact, we've been doing that now for 100 years. Right? This year is the 110th anniversary of when Vesto Slifer made his big um, observations of the large velocities thing, which was 16 years before the Hubble flight. And Hubble used his data. I wanted to ask you um, what you think licenses uh, vary fundamental constants. Well, well, from a mathematical point of view, the constant is a number, there are other possible numbers, but from a physical point of view, like, you know, why think that a constant Oh, well, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but we just don't know. We don't know why the value of G has the value of tan, right? So. Well, well, we don't know. There might be some theory that we're trying to figure out that will give us the value of G, right? So the people who do string theory, and I don't know string theory, um, have some thoughts on this matter. Joel wants to come, so. Well, I was going to give an example of what's kind of extreme. Uh, of why the physical laws might vary. Uh, Mark Scherr, my former postdoc, and I published this in Nature 25 years ago. So if you look at the laws of physics that we're familiar with, they were phase transitions. Uh, at uh, some fairly high energy, there was the phase transition associated with the big boson, where the W and Z particles got their big masses, and the other particles, like the uh, Quarks and electrons, let's talk about the electron, got its small mass. And then, uh, somewhat later, uh, so this, this is the breaking of a light for weak symmetry. And then, somewhat later, uh, there's this other phase transition where the quarks become confined. And so, in some sense, the gluons get a mass. Uh, it's not exactly what happens, but anyway, it's another phase transition that involves forces. And that led us to speculate that there might be a phase transition associated with electromagnetism if you drop the sufficiently low temperature, which will happen uh, as the universe uh, expands very rapidly, and uh, which is why you no longer can see the cosmic background radiation, for example. And so it's not inconceivable, at least we got this published in nature, that uh, there's some physics we don't know about yet that could give rise to a phase transition involving the photon and even the graviton. So that electromagnetism and gravity cease to be long-range forces. They get a ring. Just to give you an example of how just taking common ideas that are now common in physics and extrapolating them, but now in phase transitions, you could have drastically different physics than we're familiar with. Just to give you an example of if you want to, I mean, most of the time we physicists work in sort of normal physics. We assume the standard laws and we don't extrapolate wildly. But it's fun. So you know, any physicist who's worth their salt should certainly have done some extrapolations like some, some you know wild speculation like that once in a while. Some of us do it more. But, but you know, once once you know enough, then inevitably you start to uh, have thoughts like this. And I just thought I'd since you asked, I thought that would be. I think no. Things like the mass of the electron have changed with time. It was zero in the early universe, it is. Right, and that's, that's, that's that pitch transition. So why should we be surprised if it kept changing? Yeah, that, that's my basic point. And then to be very dramatic, I give you two rather dramatic examples. And then once you let like, the mass of the electron have a different value at different times in our universe, it's not crazy to say, well, in a different part of space time, it has a different value. Right? 
and we don't know how to do these calculations, or at least not fully. <laughs> We'd like to know a lot more. So I think we're shooting a little bit, you know, we're, we're playing around trying to get a grip on exactly what all the possibilities are. Now, actually, one more thing, because not everybody is probably aware of the literature. So every so often, uh, a paper gets published that says that there's actual evidence that the values of the cosmological constant, of, of the various constants, uh, are actually known to be different, are found observations to be different. Uh, one of the favorites is the electromagnetic line structure constant, uh, or you know, other constants like that. The, the fine structure constant is like 1 over 137.0 or something. Uh, yeah, the alpha. The, yeah, there's some vague evidence that it's different by about 1 part of 10 to the 5 at high redshift compared to now. And high redshift means far enough back that it's almost comparable to the age of the universe. So in rough terms, alpha could change by 1 part of 10 to the 5 over 10 billion years. And whether you believe the data or not, that kind of sets the level of our current measurement of it. So you can consider that as a real change, or you can consider that as sort of an order of magnitude estimate of how big it could change within our experiment. Exactly. That, that uh, experimental, that measurement, was then contradicted by a better measurement. So right. I think the uh, current number on alpha is that there's no evidence that it ever changed. Right, right, right. But those things have gone back and forth over exactly. the last 10 years. And, and so. they will in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's right. happening. There's a conference going on in Italy, I think it is now or next week, where a whole load of these people are all getting together and trying to nut this out. So right, right. Something very interesting might happen. I don't care. A lot of people. No, but, but as we get better and better spectral graphs and bigger and bigger telescopes, I mean, inevitably, uh, it always is sort of on the edge of the detectability that they first report these things. It's right. Been ruled out elsewhere. But that's kind of where we so are. There's always going to be this kind of discussion. Right, right. It's kind of like one part 10 to the 5 over 10 million years. So what that means is that if you want to know what the time scale for alpha changing is, you kind of have, in very rough terms, 10 to the 5 times the current age of the universe before you have to worry about that changing my projection. But after cosmological decade 15, who knows, right? <laughs> Uh, David has something to say. I, I just wanted to, to uh, ask Sean a little bit. Sean, Sean said a few minutes ago, the mass of the electron is known to have been different. Um, uh, expand on that a little bit. Well, well, all I mean is that in the standard model, right. with the Higgs boson, right. when the bed was zero, the mass was zero. Right. It's not as if we have something we like don't have experiments. astronomical evidence. We don't have astronomical evidence. We right. now have particle physics evidence that there is something called the Higgs boson, yeah, which sure. adds to our confidence that sure, that story sure, is right. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure, good. I, just... I, I was alluding to that in my comment. It was yeah. part of my preamble when I said <laughs> electromagnetism and gravity. Yeah, so Nancy wanted to say one. Um, if you just look at the physics and the cosmology of, um, of what you're discussing, then the question of whether we live at a special time or not is not really a meaningful question. What does special even mean? Special is a human sort of value judgment. And if the philosophy of cosmology is going to be useful to the rest of our society in the scientific age, then if it can tell us that in some sense we are living in a special place, it can contribute to something that's really missing in our culture, which is a sense of how we fit into the universe. Ever since the fall of uh, the medieval picture, we really have not had a picture of how humans fit into the universe. We have a picture of how the solar system works and how things work out there, but we don't have a sense of how we, as humans, fit into the big picture. And that's part of it. Part of it is to say that the Copernican time principle is not, is not true of us. If we want to feel how we fit in, we have to understand what it means to be special, what it means to have a special place. And Joel and I wrote a whole book about multiple ways that we can see that we actually are either special or, we humans or intelligent beings of other kinds of things are central or special in very unexpected ways, not literally central, but important. So I think that the philosophy of cosmology, the whole topic um, can be of use to the larger culture, not just to experts batting these ideas back and forth among themselves, 
if it can help become the basis of an understanding of how we humans fit into the larger picture. That's a good point. <laughs> I'm not sure how we can expand on that otherwise, other than thank you for pointing that out. It's a good observation. Let's go for it. It does seem like it's going to be a little difficult to move from these sort of like empirical observations about where we are time wise, where we are space wise, to these sorts of like value judgments um, that this is special, we're special, this location is special. Well, the, the usual way that that comes up is you look for coincidences uh, and you try to understand that they're just. Chance coincidences, or whether they're uh, some more fundamental thing, and uh, one that I mentioned that you know comes up frequently is uh, what Mike Turner likes to call the "why now" uh, question. Uh, so we happen to be living at around the same era that the universe switched from slowing down its expansion to speeding up its expansion. So that has to do with a apparent coincidence between two very different timelines, the evolution of intelligent life on the one hand, so we can ask the question and do the measurement, and the time scale for dominance by the dark energy, whatever it is. Is there any connection between those two? And on the face of it, not obvious. Uh, and one strategy that I mentioned uh, that people have used to try to evade the question is to have a comp to have some physics that makes the dark energy comparable to uh, the matter density, uh, dark matter and baryon density, uh, for a longer period of time, so-called tracker models. But to my knowledge, uh, they're not attractive and they don't work very well. So, uh, but so, but basically, the point I'm trying to make is that one of the ways that people turn this Copernican time principle into, you know, a question about specific time eras is by saying there seem to be coincidences where some where two different things or more are happening in the same uh, end, the, the same uh, uh, cosmological time decade. And isn't that interesting? And could we understand that? So, so it may indeed be interesting and, and, and you know, coincidences very interesting. Uh, I mean, there's still this fundamental like barrier moving from these judgments about coincidence to you know, the value of the judgments. There's, there's a name for this, this movement, naturalistic fallacy. And it seems like that's at least the barrier that one has to overcome. I, I don't see how saying this is coincident or this is a coincidence sort of justifies any one particular value. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I might be um, in need of Clarification, what do you mean by naturalistic fallacy? Moving from an is to an ought. Or um, moving from <laughs> an is claim, a descriptive claim, an empirical claim, to this or that thing is of some value, to some sort of axiological judgment, or to some perhaps moral judgment. Yeah, well, I don't think that Joel was putting moral judgments on the. <laughs> no, 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 that, that was just one example. Of I, I think the, 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 if, I, if I may, I thought, well, we, we were, we as physicists do is identify coincidences and then ask the question, is this a coincidence or is there some reason why these two things should be disconnected, might be connected, right? And I think that's okay. Yeah, so I was more latching on to um, Nancy's suggestion regarding, she, she said judgments about this or that being special, so like evaluating judgments. Okay. And, and then there was an attempt to try to, try to hook up the cosmological astrophysical stuff to this notion of being special, where that's understood to be some sort of value to and I, and I was simply saying there's somewhat of a barrier here. Okay. Fair enough. Let's take one more question here. Yes, yeah, so I'm just curious about um, this relationship between the kinds of changes in constants that it seems like we do have reasons to believe in, like the. Um, yeah, like the acquisition of mass or something like symmetry breaking mechanism and the sorts of changes that people talk about, like changes in the point of constant, but extremely slow variation in that rather than kind of forced to shift as it were. Um, it, for a, a, yeah, a forward shift from kind of one value of constant to another, uh, I don't know, instantaneously or an extremely short time period. Um, I guess, I mean, so one thing I was wondering whether 
there's any speculations about what sorts of mechanisms might drive that extremely slow gene rather than it just seems like I can point to some like symmetry breaking mechanisms. I can sort of conceptually see why that would lead to a qualitative alteration in the value of the constant. Um, I was, yeah, are there kind of speculations as to how a constant would shift its value slowly over time? Well, let me try. If I understand your question correctly, it's how can one understand what time variation of a constant you might get? Why would it be slow or would it be abrupt? First of all, your point is well taken. You could imagine that the constant in question, let's just call it g, just for the sake of it. Maybe g is varying slowly with cosmological time. Or maybe it has a value of half its value up into a certain cosmological epoch and then it makes some transition and hence today's value. And then maybe sometime in the future it will be some other value, right? So how do you actually understand any of that? Well, you need a theory that describes that. There is one theory that I can tell you about, um, at least tell you that it exists. Brand's Dickey theory is a generalization of general relativity. And in that theory, there's a scalar field that plays the role of another dynamical variable. And the value that the scalar field has at a given time sets the value of constant g. This is all in very rough terms. And if you then say that the Brand's Dickey field, as it's called, has time evolution associated with it, then the time evolution will give you the time evolution of g. Now, once you've done that, you can then build a model where you say the time evolution of that scalar field, which gives you the time evolution of g, can either be a slowly varying time evolution, in which case you get a slowly varying g, or you can imagine that it will go through some phase transition and will jump from one value to another. Um, I'm not an expert on these fields, or the, this particular class of theories, but my understanding is that um, if you then compare that class of um, theories with experiment, we've constrained it to be very, very, very slowly varying, so that it's almost indistinguishable from Einstein's non-varying general relativity. Sean's more of an expert on this, if you'd like to comment. I, I think the, the moral here is that, from a particle physics point of view, it would be much more natural to have parameters in your model change abruptly at a phase transition than to change gradually over time. And you, I could give a, a careful reason why, but the rough thing is that you're not going to get a 10 billion year time scale out of particle physics numbers, mm -hmm. but you can get 10 billion years time scale because of that exponential suppression of the tunneling problem. Right, right. So it's much easier, you'd have to tune the solar very thing a whole lot more. That's another way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. So that gives you some feel for it, but that's probably not a fully satisfactory answer. But I think the bottom line is we actually don't have a good theory for how the cons or the loss of physics should change over time, except to the extent that we do have phase transitions in our standard models, which is one version <coughs> or one way in which things can change over time. And there we have the kinds of things that we've been talking about. So we would like to know more. This is probably a good time to close out and go to lunch and have a little bit of a break before the next.